Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome former 49ers linebacker Ricky Allison. Man, how's it going? That's great. Welcome from Washington, D.C. Oh, nice, man. So you must be working the politics out there, huh? I've been on the hill today on missile defense. I'm getting a layered defense for our country. Oh, yeah. It must be really nice. But um, speaking of your NFL career, what started you into the NFL? Well, I never thought I was going to play in the NFL. I was in love with playing for USC in Southern Cal and uh, wanted to be a, you know, a national champion in Rose Bowl and uh, fell in love with USC. And I got good at what I did. And um, Ryan Lott, who was my teammate for three years at, at SC, had convinced Bill Walsh to draft me. And I ended up drafted in 1983, I think in the fifth round, to the San Francisco 49ers. It was, it was epic. Oh, that had to Best be nice. Best team in the NFL to get drafted to at that time. It was like, wow. It, so I had, was pumped. Yeah, it had to be nice to be drafted, but you were born in New Zealand, right? I was. I, I was way back, and I came over when I was eight years old and came into L.A. Uh, about, eight, about eight years old, nine years old, spent a year in L.A., and then I moved to a cowboy ranch out in the middle of Arizona and ended up playing a little football uh, against the Indian reservations and so forth <laughs> back in the day. And uh, my mom moved, my dad moved down to Tucson, Arizona, and I played in, in the biggest high school um, league in Arizona, and we ended up winning the state championship in football, and I was the best linebacker in the state and in the country and recruited everywhere, went to Notre Dame, Penn State, etc. But I wanted to go to USC. I mean, you won every championship there is, high school, college, NFL, you name it. You've done it all. And it's been spectacular life to do that. Different winning cultures, different ways to win, different diversity, and it's been spectacular. And uh, those are special, special things. And winners associate with winners to win. That's right. You, you associate with winners. And then when you got drafted in the fifth round, it had to be nice to work with somebody like Hacksaw Jack, uh, or Hacksaw Reno, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I adapted. Hacksaw, I played with Hacksaw my first two years, learned his skill sets, learned how he studied the game, and learned to perform at that level. There were great, great players on the teams I played for the 49ers on defense especially. Fred Dean was unstoppable. He was he set up that outside linebacker pass rusher off the weak side that nobody could block. We had the probably the best defensive backfield in the game with Ronnie, C dub, I mean E Wright. I mean we were we were balling. And I I don't think many people gave us credit because of how good our, our offense was. And that offense was was top with Joe and and everybody going. We had a very special, special team, as you know, and we ended up winning Super Bowls. Yeah, your defense was, like, not most talk about because you had the offense. And nobody gives credit to the defense, but you had Ronnie Lott, which you came with him at that point, and then your defense was built around. You guys built a culture, and your defense was hitting people in the mouth. That's what made it so interesting about right. watching old school football. And you got to remember, hot offenses aren't hot every week of the season. And our great offense over there had some off days. And our, you know, so we we picked up that slack. But we also knew to win the big games that we had to give the ball to Joe Montana. So we did everything we could to give the ball to that man to make the decisions that he made in clutch. And he thrived on clutch to win games. Those yeah. The, your, the offense was clutch with Montana, but your defense was underrated. Like nobody talked about how you guys made that goal line stop and all kinds of other stuff. I mean, you guys made some hits. Ronnie Lott was the most intimidating guy, but he amputated his pinky, which made him the toughest player in the NFL. 
Well, I was there for that game when he did that in the playoffs in New York Giants on that. You know, and it, back then it was all about the New York Giants defense. It was all about the Chicago Bears defense. Never about us. And we, I liked it that way. We were quicker. We were smarter. We weren't brute football players. We, we were calculated, and we could shut down a team quickly. And we could shut down a team. And it's dangerous when you have a defense like ours that can cause turnovers, sacks, force the ball. You know, we were, we were forcing them to punt. I don't even remember our punter. If you're on a bad team, you, you have a good punter, and you know who your punter is. I don't even think we punted much. I mean, we were that good. <laughs> it was, so it's really hard. You know, when I watch our teams, I always compare them to the teams I played for in San Francisco. Yeah, these great defenses, but it doesn't compare to how you guys are because you guys won championships. But how do you feel about this current Niners team, like this defense-wise? Well, I thought this defense was the best I've seen in a decade because of the culture of it. That If you watch the, them, they they compete to get to that ball carrier. They, they, there's no jogging. There's no one guy just going at it. They go as a group. It's a contagious culture that you see. They take great honor and take great pride in that. They're devastating up front in the D-line. They're devastating at the linebacker skill position and at the DP position. They've got it all. And I was so proud of them yesterday. I was proud of them for what they did that first half and, and held a game that could have been 50 to nothing in that first quarter, second quarter, and they competed and put that team in check. So I, I, I'm really, you know, honored that that team played the way, the defense played the way it, it did in that first half. I mean, it was too much because as soon as the quarterback was injured and then as soon as our – Fourth string quarterback got hurt too. It was kind of hard to come from behind. And plus, this offense wasn't moving as like as effective as they could. But this defense tried their best to hold on. Yeah, and, and you know, as a defensive player, it doesn't matter what happens on the other side of the ball. You know, you get you get you get put in the worst situations. You have to come out as a defense when you get when you when your offense gives up an interception, gives up a sack, you know, players get hurt, you have to come in and stop it and change that momentum that's all switched over there that happened. Hang on, hang on. Um, sorry. And so there are a couple things happened in that game that really, for me, was, 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 was a, you know, a huge issue. The catch that wasn't a catch that was on a third down and long that set up the scoring drive on the very first series or second series of the Eagles. And the NFL not to turn that over, not to regress that. If that thing was done correctly, like it should be in, a, in an NFC Championship playoff game, Purdy wouldn't have got hurt. That The whole scenario would have changed because you would have punted them the ball and we would have better field position and so forth to go, to go on. And so the league's got to look at this, and this was not right on a championship game. The refs got to call that stuff out critically on that. Then I think the next, you know, if you look at what happened, and that's our play calling, because our play calling on offense, you don't put your second string tight end in space trying to block the best defensive end they've got coming off the corner. That's how he got hurt. We had a bad play call, a, a bad blocking scheme. And he did that twice, if you watch that. They kept putting a second-string tight end in space on the best defensive passer. There's no way he can block him no, mat no matter what. So that, that was, to me, upsetting that we didn't think that through correctly to do that. And then, you, as you know, no team, I don't think, in the NFL history has ever won a championship game when their starting quarterback gets hurt in the first quarter or a Super Bowl. I haven't seen one or maybe even a playoff. So we were in jeopardy right then when your number one player gets hurt. But our, our defense rallied, man. They rallied. And Philadelphia had all sorts of other breaks and they still couldn't get up. They were lucky to get the, you know, the, the 14 
should have been seven seven. And then how about McCaffrey running this shit with no with no passing threat? And we muscled that. I mean, it was it was phenomenal football from from my perspective in that first half to fight everything everything they could throw at you to, to make you lose. Yeah, the part of the blocking part, like you said, that backup tight end, it just didn't make sense. Like that was terrible scheme wise, the way how Shanahan put it. And uh, yeah, McCaffrey, outside of McCaffrey, he was pretty much that entire offense. Like he had eighty yards carrying under him. No, and- but but you have all these weapons, but you, the decision making in, in, in San Francisco football, it is about the quarterback. Our whole culture is about that quarterback and about getting him the ball and trusting him to make the great decisions in the game. You took the decision maker out of the game early and and we can't function that way the foreigners don't function without a great quarterback in that position because it enables all the other players we have a great offensive line we have all that stuff but if you don't have that that decision maker get that ball to all those players you don't have the team that that got you there absolutely like there hasn't been a team that's gone through so many quarterback injuries. The closest one I can think of is the Cardinals in 2015. They had so many injuries at that position. Yeah, but, you know, opportunity six that. And greatness comes out with opportunity like that. Purdy came out of that. We, If it didn't happen, we wouldn't have someone like Purdy. And he's going to be probably the starter next year. He should be. And, you know, you've got something to build on. you got a young franchise. That, so there's some good things, you know, you, you, we, we've got a great quarterback and that defense is still phenomenal. You just got to keep everybody. It's hard in this game. Like in my day, everybody was stayed with the team. You know, we, we had barely a couple of free agents on the fringes, but that's the, that's what the general managers got to do is try to keep this team intact. So in your days, free agent wasn't quite a big thing, right? Yeah, we I didn't have free agency my first couple of years. So we you know, we we could leave the team if we wanted to. And then they put the plan B in at the end of my career, and I was the first one on plan B to leave the four nines and play for the Raiders. So I so I took advantage of that when that happened there. So what was it like going from the Niners to the Raiders? What was the difference? It was light and day, man. Black and white. That culture is completely the opposite of the San Francisco 49er culture, completely hands down opposite. The way they practice, the habits, the, the thinking, the structure, the whole thing. So it was, you know, it was, it wasn't the San Francisco 49ers. But I was able to bring the San Francisco culture of winning to the Raiders. And we won. We went to the playoffs twice. And then Ronnie and Roger Craig followed me. And then and then uh, Jerry Rice followed, and, R- and Rathman followed, and Jamie followed. I mean, it, it, so Al figured it out that we knew how to win and how to set the culture in his franchise to help them win. Yeah, they got to bring winning culture, and that's how they wanted to bring into, I guess, guys like you and so on, man. They Like, what is it with these Raiders? They like to take a lot of these Niner players a lot, man. It's like – Well, they, they, because they knew they were winners. I started it. We started that, Right. And, and winning's contagious. And people that know how to win know how to practice to win. They know how to study in the locker room. They know how to get to get with it. I mean, they know, they know how to be teammates, man. They know how to win. So you got to have these guys on your teams. I mean, you can have the best talent in the world, like a lot of these NFL teams, and they can't win. Yeah, it's all about bringing guys who know how to win. And I guess Al Davis has always yeah. been known to be a winner. So he's always had the best track record. He's always been known to bring. Well, yeah, but Al Davis, Al Davis goes and gets the people that they that nobody wants that 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 are the problem child. And, and you know that that that's a culture too. You know, Bill Walsh said, "Hey, you know, we can't have more than three superstars on this team. Can't do it. They'll, yeah, they'll divide the team." Al would say, hey, well, we need 20 or, you know, whatever. <laughs> so you have a lot of that aspects of it. Yeah. Now, here's a good question. Why is it out there that the, that the, this Super Bowl is rigged? Do you think it's rigged or something or no? Oh, well, you know, the president of the United States is a Eagle fan. It's kind of tough watching the commissioner of the NFL sitting with the first lady. The little narrative that probably – shouldn't shouldn't have been there 
I think the league on both the games, not just our game, had too much refereeing deciding outcomes of plays and outcomes of games. You cannot have a a game decided in the last play on a call. You can't do that at the playoff level. You got to let the guys play. And you got to be very careful on the calls because the calls that have nothing to do with the outcome of the play and are not super flagrant, you let them play. These refs did not do that. These refs on both games made some very poor calls that weren't, shouldn't have been called, that changed the momentum of the game and gave, they gave the other team more ability to win. We saw that in our game. Right off the bat, we saw that in Cincinnati game. So I don't know the, I don't know what's happening because I thought the best refs of the entire league that were graded throughout the whole season were the ones that are supposed to be doing the best games right now. Oh, yeah. Like, it's kind of been questionable. Like, I think that Bengals game was very questionable from that get-go. Like, it just no, seems – you just don't have – listen, you played the game for, what, 20 – I don't know how many – four or five months? You should have perfected your skill sets. You shouldn't be – you know, th- there shouldn't be nothing to ref. You got you to gotta, you gotta let the guys play and get out of the way and not be the factor on it. And it shouldn't have happened. They should let the players play. Absolutely. Like, but do you think refs need to be more accountable? Do they need to get like like punishments a little bit for poor calls? Or or you think it's just is what it is? No, you know what the problem is? The refs don't report to the coaching staffs. So the coaching staffs in the NFL know the game better than anybody on the field and deal with the refs. The refs report to the owners. So that's a different reporting system. Yeah, that's pretty much the issue with them is like, yeah, they it's like refs are going to call in poor plays every now and then. And it, and it is kind of terrible how some outcomes have to determine it. But, uh, yeah, you know, that's something we have to deal with. And I know it's hard to get some consistent referees. I mean, they can either be blind or they can either be on point. Yeah, but they shouldn't change the game. They should at this level that we play in in a championship game. Absolutely. And the game's gotten soft the way they're like the way they're hitting. Like you can't even hit like in your guys' days. Your days you would hit people and it wouldn't be like such a big flag. Yeah, I think I think the game's changed because it, it's they've allowed the pass interference thing. It's probably more so than the hitting thing to enable a much bigger advantage for the offensive player. The offensive player has a tremendous advantage on that. So I think that that's been really the game, as you can see, and look what McCaffrey did. Look what he did. They, they don't know how to tackle. They're, they've taken away tackling. So these guys are ankle biting or not even bringing people down. So the, the skill set's not very good on tackling. And that comes from the league and it comes all the way down to high school and college where fundamentally you don't practice fundamental tackling. Yeah. The tackling's a lot different then because like the way the fundamental is like you can't hit up like up to the upper area. You have to hit way lower. And sometimes those reduces a lot of injuries. Yeah. But if you look, I, I, I'll take a different look at it. I, I'm seeing more guys getting hurt every week in this game with all sorts of stuff than when I played. I mean, Absolutely. I don't know if that's off-season stuff. These guys are soft, but they're not durable on that aspect of it. And I think these kids are are training too much. They're, they're every they're, Back in our day, we took a month off or two months off or three months. And these guys are going every day putting stress on their joints, so their joints are already overworked when they get in there. But going back to the game, the game that I played, it's about intimidation a little bit. Not a little bit, a lot bit. We've tried, the league's tried to take the intimidation factor and the fear factor of crossing that middle or, or getting punished by a linebacker or punished to change it. That was part of the game. And you had to man up and have the courage to handle that. And it was a great part of the game that I think the fans enjoyed. I certainly, as a linebacker, enjoyed it. And you've seen those 
Tatum, you've seen some hitters, man, right? I mean, so somehow they're trying to take that away. And I think I think there's drama, right? The fans watch drama of intimidation and see who is skillful enough to handle that or not handle that. So I think I think to me, that's the sad thing of the game that has somewhat departed this game. Yeah, the physicality part is like not as like it used to be. Like you said, they changed a lot of the stuff, and it's not like like the fans enjoy the drama stuff. They enjoy the hits, and it's become less interesting. They only care about the offense, if I'm being honest. Yeah, but the most violence is not line on line because they're right next to each other, right? They're face to face. It's not big man on big man. It's those guys, the fullbacks, the running backs, the linebackers that they got like you know, 10 meters or, or I'm sorry, 10 yards, five yards away from each other. That's where the violence comes and the contact comes and the speed and the safeties and that speed and area. So, you know, the big guys don't get that much fun. That's the same always. That's never going to change the game because they're right there on top of each other. It's the guys in space. And that's, that's the game there where intimidation happens and collisions happen. High contact happens. Absolutely. Yeah, it does. And, um, so speaking of, of what you've done in your entire career, you have a son who played tight end in the NFL, Red Ellison, right? Yeah, sure did. He had a hell of a career. He was a blocking tight end. He probably even he was a great one, but he didn't want to be, he couldn't handle the Philadelphia Eagle, the best pass rusher coming off that edge of space. I and mean, that's a difficult, difficult thing for a tight end to do. Start any tight end can't do. They're not paid to do that. You, you know, you need 300 pounds on your body to do that. Yeah, like it, no blocking tight end can match up with a guy like Hassan Riddick. I mean, Riddick was like a hybrid type edge rusher. Yeah, but, but those, but that defense is scheme them ways around to get their best pass rusher coming on a tight end to block him on. That's what they do. That's the point. Or that's what they try to scheme. You understand that, right? Yeah, they try to scheme on that, and it doesn't. They, I mean, because but, but, but our team didn't have to scheme. We just gave it to them as a gift. For, you know, as a gift, as a Super Bowl gift. Yeah, it is. It is. It's kind of like we just we shouldn't we should have stuck with our tackle doing it, but we let our tight end like who 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 wants to go with the second string no, tight it's end? It's the play call. It's the play call. It was a misdirection play call. You can't you can't you can't do it this game, and you got to know who's the shutdown guy. You got to know where LT is, Lawrence Taylor, right? You got to know where that best pass rusher is. The whole and you got to slide your ass over there. You got to chip him. You got to double him. You got to do everything you can. You can't just do what you just did. Yeah, that's definitely was that that's definitely on Shanahan, man. That that play calling scheme. Was I don't kind know of, who who's calling the plays. I have no idea what that was. So I'm just yeah. pointing that out that 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 was a flaw. Definitely was. Um, so you were like inducted to the Polynesian Football Hall of Fame, right? I am. Yeah, uh, a couple of years ago, following Jesse, my teammate Sapolo, who I think runs that that selection committee. It had to be nice to be honoring one of those uh, Hall of Fames right there. And then I was the first New Zealander and first Maori of Maori descent. So it was pretty cool. It had to be a nice honor to be in that elite list right there with those Polynesians. And they got, they they can hit, man. Like a lot of the Polynesian players, man, they got passion. They got that intensity, yeah. bro, that you can never. They like protect. open space. They like open space and intimidation. So what's your thoughts of Tolano Hufanga, man? That oh, I think he's gifted. I think he's, he's a lot like Troy Palomano because he, He's and Ronnie, you know, he, he can see things and he's able to anticipate momentum changes in the game and plays. And he's got some freedom to break away from the game plan. So I think as I look at, it, I see it. He's 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 got a special, you know, they've given him special to do what he wants to do. If he feels it and sees it, he gets it. You got it. And, and, and the offenses can't account for it. They can't they can't draw a play against it. That's what's so great about it. And so, I, yeah, he's 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 an awesome player. He's going to be a great player for us. Yeah, he is. I mean, he, he'll only get better with the experience. But what's your thoughts of Drake Greenlaw, man? That guy brings that physicality a little bit different than most linebackers we got. Yeah, no, I, I think you, you've got – I mean, your linebackers are so good that they couldn't – you know, most pe- teams that would have to play against Hurts, you'd have to have a spy guy. To just to look at the, we didn't have to do any of that because our linebackers had the speed. And again, like I said in the beginning, they are rallying to the ball. They are leading that culture to compete to get to that ball carrier. They're great open field tacklers. 
and they can cover the ground. I mean, we've got good linebackers. The 49ers have always had good linebackers on it. And, you know, what makes everything great is that pass rush and that D-line. So, you know, that, that when, you, when those teams can't handle that, everybody gets better. Yeah, linebackers are always been their strength, no matter who we had back in the days. Like even on the back of my picture, you had Derek Smith on one of the pitchers. He was a good linebacker, also at one point. Yeah, no, we've, we've done a good job on that scheme. You know, we've done a great job on pass rush. You know, the hybrid with Charles Haley, Fred Dean. You know, you got all up to Boza now. You've got some great inside linebackers that have played for the form. Many better than I am that that have played well for the 49ers. Oh, there's a good question. I don't know if you ever did this part. Did you sing with Huey Lewis in the news? I sure did. I cut a platinum record, hip to be square, man. That was uh, with Ronnie and Dwight Clark and Joe Montana. I had a mu- I had hair back then. I had a mullet, and that was uh, no. We 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 had a great time doing that. That was the that was the '84 championship game against the Chicago Bears to lead into our Super Bowl win. That's when Huey Lewis was the deal. We had, There was a concert in the Oakland Coliseum on the week, I think, before the Chicago Bear game. It, it was jacked up. Everybody was going crazy. So, yeah, we, we uh, that was fun. I mean, those were like the days when you had certain, like, singers, like, hype you guys up. Like, that was like the days before they even did highlight hype videos. You would have these type of singers do it in person. Yeah, well, I mean, there, there's nothing like the stick, too, man. I, I, I know, I know the stadium in Santa Clara, but it's not the stick. The stick was rocking, man. <laughs> the chance, you know, back and forth. That that was a very special place to play in playoff season. And all my what seven years with the 49ers, all our playoffs, we were home, man. And those championship games were. Well, except for one, we're home. But there's, I mean, the, we had an advantage. The fan base was tremendous. The whole thing, you know, the cold side of the field where the visitors were, where the wind comes off the tunnel on that, you know, coming out of the, the baseball dugouts, got dirt on the field. <laughs> it was crazy. Good wow. stuff. Those were good stuff then, man. Like a lot of all the good stuff there. I mean, you had, I mean, he, he then, I mean, Huey Lewis was a popular singer during those days, man. It was a big yeah, game. he sang the national anthem with us. Yeah, man. So when you look back at your career, man, it's like it has to be just a blessing just to have championship on all levels, man. You look back in time and say, I had a damn good career. Well, it's, I've been very fortunate. You know, I played all my career on grass. I played all my career in California. I mean, who does? <laughs> that's that's pretty cool. <laughs> And, you know, I, I started playing in the L.A. Coliseum and I ended my last game in the L.A. Coliseum um, and played for, for, I think it's family, you know. I played with Ronnie for 12 years, man. Who plays with somebody for 12 years on defense? The same starting backfield. And, you know, having Bill Walsh, Stanford coach. I mean, all, I see for Oregon. We were all, this is well, this was West Coast, West Coast, you know, except for Joe. Um no, it was, it was super special, and the type of athletes from Bo Jackson to Charles White, who just passed, to Marcus, to Jerry Rice, to Joe, all that was just tremendous to see these type of athletes perform the way they did and be part of that and, and help to lead that and help to emotionally move forward and play the game at the highest levels to win. Absolutely, man. That winning culture, it's something that it's addicted to you, and it's just a great feeling to have. Yeah, that. no, I, I really believe we were going to win. After that first half, man, I saw glimpses of resilience to get over the top of this. I was hoping that Purdy was going to come back in the after halftime. That's why I think the whole team did, right? We all we're thought all he was going to come back. And, we, and the defense held that game to have him come back. And then when the guy – the, the quarterback dropped the ball, all hope left. I mean, that, that you could see it. You could see it. You know, that, that confidence that we have in anything, it left. It departed. And then it was – that's when the will was broke. And that and you can't do anything about that. I mean, that's, that was the problem, right? I'm just giving you where momentum shifts were happening. 
Oh, yeah, it was. As soon as he got injured, this offense was falling apart from right on there. Uh, well, no, but but they they weren't falling apart. They scored. They scored, man. They scored with the McCaffrey. It's that second half when, when they they came back and they didn't have their starting quarterback because that – a lot of people want to thought it was, he could have played, and then they then the the other kid didn't know how, you know he got a little pressure in the, and and got that turnover. That's when I think the the momentum shifted, unstoppable, for us to to win that game. Absolutely. Oh, here's an interesting question: Do you still keep keep in contact with Joe Montana? Ah, uh, every once in a while when I see him, you know his son played at Notre Dame. I my son played for SC. And uh, I never lost to Notre Dame when I played at SC. And I beat Joe. Joe, Ronnie and I beat Joe in the Coliseum to win that championship. And then when I got drafted to the 49ers, we ended up never beating Notre Dame for the next, like, 60 years. <laughs> Damn. So, so after Notre Dame, I was wearing green. I mean, Joe had me on my green and all that. And then my and then my son came back, you know, with peak. Carol and he only lost once, but I love that about him. And you know he's he's a great man. He he's he's probably the number one competitor when pressure's on the line over Steve Young, over Jerry, over anybody that you would want to lead over Tom Brady because he could he can move out of the pocket, he could do things third, fourth, and the team believed in. He was magical. He was magical. Absolutely. I think he would be the best 49er in the history of the 49ers, would be Joe, best athlete. He was the one that won the championships. He was the one that – We became... all won it, but he he was the one that made the decisions to, win, to finish it, right? We all got him the ball. We all carried the ball for him, but he was the one. And I think Jerry Rice was the hardest worker, the most dedicated uh, perfectionist, in training that was you know the best then we had the wild you know no rules fred dean and charles haley that didn't abide by any rules and were unblockable and then you had the hitter of ryan lott and, and an opposite leader than joe ronnie was was boisterous he was loud he spoke to the team he called people out joe would never i mean complete opposite good and bad but he was on defense Nothing good. I'm just giving you that aspect of it on that. And we had characters. You got to have characters, man, on your team. <laughs> yeah, the characters are what, what wins games, and they, even their personality can stand out too. Especially yeah, yeah. a lot of the guys, like like Charles Haley was a wild man, from what I'm heard. Like I heard he was like one of those guys. Like, yeah, was... but you got you you can't win world championships with milk and cookie stuff, man. You got to have some crazy people on your team. You have to, but you got to be able to manage them. You have yeah. to have that, else you won't be able to win. It's got to mix. It's got to be really good with it, you know. Like you said, none of that cookie cutter, or all the other stuff, man. It's got to have a mix of everything. That's what makes the recipe yeah. so great. Yeah, heck yeah, and, and you know, we we were pretty good because you know we had someone like Steve Young who was you know I don't know a doctor or a high education, and John Frank, and we had guys that didn't even get past the eighth grade, man, in the same locker room. So that was going on. <laughs> it was it, it was good. You know, it wasn't as bad as the Raiders where there were, you know, criminals and all sorts of stuff in there. But I think what Bill Walsh really did that nobody else did back in the day. Back in the day, the Dallas Cowboys, they did this analytics where they would measure each of their players. So each position had an optimal height, weight, strength, speed, all that crap. And they would they would draft that and go to that. Our boy Bill Walsh didn't believe in that. He believed in heart and the unmeasurable leadership capability of making the right decision at the right time under pressure. And he took players like that, man. And that was phenomenal what he did. I mean, picking Joe in that late round, a lot of us came in that way. And he had, he had that grit factor, that heart factor, that other teams over overlooked or didn't know how to cultivate that. Absolutely. And then you're like a fifth round gym. You came into the lead in 1983 and you were just 
You were just I had three, three major knee cr- constructions, and, and nobody, you know, what the cool thing about what happened with me is my college coach, John Robinson, went to the Rams the same time I came out. And Bill specifically, I think, drafted me to be run defense against the Rams, against Eric Dickerson. And we and, and it was perfect. <laughs> I mean, you look at our run defense, man. You look at all the running backs. We, Walter Payton, Kirk Best, and we shut down the best. John Riggins, Earl Camp, we had everybody. We shut that down. Real proud of that. What was it like playing? What was it like playing with Marcus Allen then playing against him? Well, Marcus and I were freshmen together. We came into USC, same class. We were the two rookies, you know, you understand that? Yeah. So I played with him as my college teammate for those those five years at, at SC. And then my first game, a preseason game in 83 when I was drafted was against the Raiders. And can you believe that? That that Raider team won the Super Bowl that year with Marcus Allen on that team. And so that was pretty unique. And then obviously we we had some we had some big battles against the Raiders. We won most of them, I think. We lost one of them. And then uh, playing with him, and then that dynamic with Bo Jackson, Al Davis, and Marcus was was interesting to see how that panned out. But I think one of the toughest things ever in practice that I've ever done in my life as a linebacker was to have one-on-one pass defense against Marcus Allen and Bo Jackson with a pylon in front of you <laughs> and nobody, no help anywhere. <laughs> that, that was, that was, that was like depressing, man. There's no way you can cover those guys. I don't care who you are. I could cover them. But we had to do that every Tuesday or something like that, or every Wednesday. It was pretty fun. I mean, you were adjusted to it. I mean, you you practiced with them before and you played against them, so you have your understanding how to play them. So it's like, you get it. Yeah, but there's certain – I mean, there's no there's no better athlete ever since Jim Thorpe than Bo Jackson. Do you understand this? He, he, yeah. he didn't even come in the season. He was playing baseball. Yep. He baseball. walks in. He, he doesn't even like practice. He didn't want to practice. He, was he shows up in the first game, no practice, and runs 230 yards. I mean, he's unbelievable. He was unbelievable. Nobody, nobody I've ever seen or played with. Did you ever tackle Marcus Allen? Yeah. I, come on, man. I played for the ah. four years. No, nah, he's asking the question, but I'm just saying, like, yeah, he was an exceptional player. But Bo Jackson, a generational talent, just the injuries. With yeah, I had to tackle him, too. I mean, yeah. Marcus is very hard to tackle because he's very slippery. And he's he's really smooth inside. You don't get a good shot at him at all. Yeah, I mean, Mark, Bo will give you a good shot, but he just run over you, run by. <laughs> so he was. Yeah, Briggs like was pretty did. damn tough too, man. And then Christian, uh, what's the the Nigerian nightmare? That that dude was pretty tough. Then Walter had a heart. You know, but there were some good backs back then. Is that I'm looking Billy Sims and Barry Sanders was damn good. Some good stuff. Yeah, I guess Marcus Allen was a smooth guy that was hard to get, so I guess he had some good movements or something. Yeah, well, he's an SC tailback, man. You know that. Oh he's yeah, a Heisman. He's one of the great tailbacks. He's got he's got a rhythm, acceleration, but he had a hell of a line at, at uh, the Raiders. Absolutely, man. Hey, I definitely appreciate you on the show. I know you probably had a little bit of time, but uh, for anybody else, man, this is this is the legend, Ricky Ellison. Niners great, and hey, he played a hell of a good career, right? I enjoyed my career. I was very fortunate. Thank you, and thanks for all that support. And don't give up hope on the 49ers. We'll, we'll be fine. We're going to adjust to it. But it was, you know, there's nothing you can do. When your quarterback, starting quarterback goes down in a playoff game, it's done, no matter who you are. So there's nothing to be ashamed of, and we'll get better. Absolutely. Maybe down the road I'll get you back on, man. It was awesome to talk some football and get a lot of your stories, man. But, uh, hey, for everybody else, man, this was three-time Super Bowl champion Ricky Ellison, two-time national champion. Ricky Ellison, man, this guy's done it all. There's not any other NFL player that's done it all in his entire career. Thank you. All right, no problem, sir. Go Clovis, uh, baby. Go Clovis. Love it. Oh, yeah.